along with my presentation. Oh, no. Yes, okay. So my name is Bart. Um, I am Dutch, I live in Amsterdam. Um, got interested in Drupal uh, about 10 years ago after numerous failed attempts at writing my own systems. Because um, at some point somebody pointed out, maybe it's a good idea if you don't try to do it all yourself. Um, got hooked. Um, started building my own sites with it. Uh, started yelling at it because it didn't do what I wanted. And then uh, that was Drupal 4. And then around the time Drupal 5 came out, I started writing my contribute modules. I've been writing those for five, six, seven, and eight. I've helped with Drupal Core seven and eight. Um, it's a process of the more you dislike, the more you force yourself to just fix this one little thing and just, it drags you along. Been to a lot of events, organized a lot of events. Um, I'm the founder of the Dutch Drupal Foundation. Um, because of those events that we organized, uh, at some point it's not very fun if you have to pass 10,000 euros through your own product bank account. Um, and that was when the uh, the, the conferences we organized were still relatively small. Um, I started speaking. I'm a mentor at DrupalCon, so we help people. Uh, we introduce them to contribution to Drupal Core. Like we help them get their tools set up. Uh, we mentor them find, through issues, um, creating a patch, reviewing a patch, um, marking someone else's patches, reviewed and tested and ready for a core committer to look over it and potentially commit it to core. Um, and that stuff all happened because, as a teenager, I was interested in this stuff, and I liked doing it. Uh, so, um, you see how, uh, how strangely life can turn out. Um, this is one of the things Fig, that really interested me about Core, for the reasons I just said I gave you. Um, we're much more interoperable with other uh, pieces of software, uh, but this also means that we can work together with other people a lot more, um, because we have a reason now. Our, piece, our software works together, so we have to work together, and we have Lots of good discussions uh, between people with different backgrounds, different points of view, expertises. Um, it's made my job a lot more fun. Um, a little little status report. Um, especially up until Drupal 7, we've done everything our own way. Um, one of the few bits of code that we used in Drupal that wasn't originally Drupal's own was jQuery. Uh, I think Drupal 7 has a class that we, uh, for working with tar files, extracting them, packaging them, that we stole from somewhere else. We adapted it, we put it in our own repository like it was our own kind of thing. You know, we kept the credits intact, but we treated it like it was our own code, um, just like the rest of it. Um, so we did everything ourselves. We, we, solved, our, we solved our own problems. Um, in doing so, sometimes created new problems, um, because some problems are really difficult. Um, and it's very easy to fix them the wrong way, fix them partly, or make it even worse. Um, we finally realized that about four or five years ago when you know, we started working on Drupal 8 and we realized uh, there's all this stuff that we're doing and that we're not doing properly enough or well enough. Um, we can't really fix it. But there are all these other things um, around us, uh, frameworks, uh, lower level packages that solve these problems that we're having and they're pretty good at it and people like them. Um, so we um, looked at in, like using those packages, um, but while like, keeping in mind those are different packages, we're working together. Um, and that was shortly after the rest of the PHP community had a similar um, moment of enlightenment. Um, because one of the, the, the concepts in software development is don't do the same thing twice. That's silly. Um, it's a waste of your time. And uh, at best, and at worst, you create the same bug point in the two different things that you do, or the three different things that you do that are actually rather similar. Um, so, to summarize that, reuse is good. Um, if you have something that can be used in multiple projects, it's great. It saves you time, but it also means that the user base of that package, product, library, whatever it is, or you want to call it, is bigger. The more people who use something, the better your quality control is. The, um, the more people, the more knowledge is involved. Um, maybe there's a tiny bug, and if the user base is really big, the chances of someone being around who knows how to fix it are a lot higher than when you write something yourself, uh, and it's more obscure. So duplication is bad. Yeah, don't don't copy the same piece of code. Don't try to do the same thing again. We've all seen it in Star Wars. It turns out bad. Um, then came along Composer, 
And, um, well, we're, we're actually, we're in, we're in Austria, um, a country that has produced several great composers in, uh, in human history. Um, but this is a piece of software. Um, I'm sure that these people um, above me were composing as well, and they made some great music, although it looks a little bit more festive than something like Mozart. Um, Composer as a software a package is a package manager. Um, it basically does uh, what our module info files do and what Drush does for us. It just does it in a slightly more modern and better way. And it does it for packages that are not specific to Drupal as well. Um, which is great, because now we have a package manager for PHP, we've had it for a couple of years now, that works for any PHP project. It's a bit like NPM for Node, uh, PIP for Python, um, and it has contributed a lot to making PHP grow, to making it a more adult, grown-up language, well, not necessarily the language, but the ecosystem and the community around PHP um, have benefited greatly, um, both in terms of software interaction, but also of people working together. Um, what you do is you add a composer.json file to your module, like a package.json file, if you work with NPM for Node, um, you specify some of the metadata, and you specify its dependencies. And if you run a composer install command, on, it's, a, it's a CLI script, uh, for that package, um, it will automatically resolve all the dependencies using packages.org, which is the repository of all composer packages. Uh, it will download the dependencies and put them in the right subfolders. Um, and in that regard, it is more friendly than Drush, because Drush still asks you, like, are you sure you want to install this one Drupal Commerce module, like the presentation we are just in, because it has these 23 dependencies. And like, yeah, that's why I wanted to install this module in the first place. So Composer does it all for you. It doesn't ask all the weird questions. It, it just does it. Um, so that's step one. We, we finally had the infrastructure to share and reuse our code. Um, um, and Composer was built on a couple of standards, and these standards were originally developed by Fig, and Fig is something delicious you can eat, um, but it's commonly known in the PHP world as the Framework Interoperability Group, and this interoperability uh, word, adjective, argument is very important because it's about working together, about making software work together, operable. Um, and it's a group that consists of a number of different developers, there are uh, 20, 30 people in there, right now, last time I checked anyway. Um, and they all represent different PHP frameworks. Um, so um, the standards are open source. Uh, you can actually uh, join them on IRC or look them up on GitHub. The URL is uh, going to be shown at the end. Um, this is actually what I just said. Um, every, or major, most major PHP frameworks, uh, WordPress actually accepted, I discovered this morning, um, have a representative in Fig that represents the entire project, and ours is Larry Garfield Krell. You can see him through the uh, through the title. Um, Krell uh, lives in Chicago, um, has been a Drupal core uh, contributor for many many years, has architected a lot of systems. Um, very smart guy, and he um, works with the other Fig members uh, while um, making sure that. Um, the problems that we have, because Drupal is a, is, a, is a major complex system that is used by many people, and we have our own set of problems to solve uh, because we have a certain target audience and a certain size. And as a representative, Larry um, discusses such problems with the other FIC members and um, see if the standards that they come up with, that they design, solve the problems for all of us. And we can solve a problem once for all these PHP frameworks. Um, and we don't have to do it multiple times. So there's uh, Fabian Potencier from Symphonies in there, and there are a couple of other people as well. Um, and Fig comes up with standards. Um, they just don't just make them up, which are where the wind blows. Um, but there's a problem. Everything always starts with a problem. Um, so some of the things they do have to do with logging, or with auto-loading, or dependency injection. And those are, those are the problems that, or the, the, the features, whatever you want to call it, every project has to solve. Every project has to handle the requests and the response. Um, so you have to deal with HTTP. There's a standard for that. Um, every project has to log, whether it is to file or to email or to your database. You always need to log. You always need to make sure that you know what's going on. Um, so those are the, the generic problems that FIG 
tries to help solve. It doesn't always work, um, but they're doing their best to come up with reusable solutions. Um, eventually, when a project or when a, a proposal for a standard it, it enters draft phase and then um, it can still be worked on, it can still change, and it enters a review phase, and a larger group of people takes a look at it, and then it enters the vote, voting phase. And then the members of FIG, like Larry, can vote on whether they like um, that standard or not. It sounds very cheap, doesn't it? All right. Um, but the cool thing is that even if you think the standard is good, you don't have to use it as a project. Um, and there can be a couple of reasons for doing so. You can simply disagree. Like, um, we like the standard, but we need something else. That's perfectly fine. Not everybody has the exact same problem. Um, another reason could be that implementing it right now or in the next year would break your release cycle. Uh, something that Symfony did, for instance, because they have their own HTTP request and response handling. And then uh, PSR7 came out, which is a big standard for handling requests and responses. Look, yeah, we just, we just published a new version of our framework. We can't just implement this because it'll break everything. So they resolved to write in an adapter library that wraps the native symphony handling in something that complies with the standard. Um, but everybody's free to do what they want every framework. So gassy water doesn't work well in this bottle. Let's, so let's unscrew it for a second. See, there's always a solution to your problem. All right. Um, so these standards have the name PSR. Um, PHP standard recommendation, with PHP being another acronym. We like that. We're nerds. We like wrapping acronyms and acronyms. Um, and every PSR has a name like this. PSR dash and then a number. And that number is rather arbitrary. Basically, if you... We have 12 PSRs in the system right now. The first, the next time someone sub, uh, submits another proposal, it'll be PSR 13. The next one will be 14. The number is rather meaningless. It is really just a sequential uh, ID. Um, any code that is part of a standard is published um, on GitHub. Um, that might change in the future, but that's where it is now. And it can, and they're, they're exposed as composer packages. Um, which means that we use that infrastructure that uses the standards to include the code that is part of the standards. Um, in practice, some packages have PHP interfaces as code, but they never have anything logical because they don't do anything for you except specify an API to work with. Um, and it's all on GitHub, uh, which means, oh, this works a little less nicely um, if you have a lot of slides with little steps in it, everything is open source. All the little details of every single standard is open. You can look at it, um, even if uh, you can't vote on it, because if you're not part, you're not a representative of a framework, you can look at it, you can discuss it, you can tweet about it, you know exactly what people are up to. There's nothing secret about it. You can talk to your representative and be like, hey, or to Larry, like if you have a big trip module and you use, like, oh, this standard would be really great, great, but it would pose a problem for us. If we do it a little bit differently, that would work. And then Larry can take that feedback into FIG and as an official representative say, like, this is my point of view on behalf of the Drupal project. Um, otherwise, it's entirely open. We've got these communication channels. Um, you can join them right now. Um, so, 12 PSRs exist right now. Um, some of them follow up earlier ones, like this one. Um, PSR 1 and 2 are about coding standards. Um, uh, these are actually, because we're nerds, we start counting on zero, these are actually the second and the third PSRs that FIG has published. So the very first one comes after this for a good reason. Um, PSR 1 is a basic coding standard. standard. Um, PSR 2 includes PSR 1, but adds a little extra. It's really just like our Drupal coding standards. The, reason, the simple reason we don't use PSR 1 or 2 is that we've got our own standards. We already had them, we were already busy working on Drupal 8, and it made no sense for us at that time to convert the entire code base to comply with PSR 2. Uh, we might do that in the future, uh, because it, is a, it takes a lot of time to maintain our own coding standards, um, partly because PHP evolves, the world evolves, and we have to keep up with our standards. More about that at the very 
very last PSR. Um, this PSR does not include any code. It's a description of how you should structure your code, but there's nothing you can include through Composer. There's just no API, no interface. PSR 3 is a very, very cool one. It was the first PSR that included PHP code that you could include. Um, and it basically specifies a logger interface. And the logger interface really has nothing more than a couple of methods to log methods with different severity levels. Um, info, warning, emergency, everything in between. Um, the reason we want to abstract this out into a standard is because there are a thousand and one ways to log a piece of information. Um, on development, you want to in your database so you can access it quickly. On production, you want it only in the file. However, if shit hits the fan, you want to be woken up in the middle of the night by a text message. It's fine. You can have different packages that do these things, and they all implement this one standard. Um, and depending on your project, you can include these packages. You can inject a logger of your choice in a class that has things to do, that wants to notify the system, and then your logger deals with it. Your class just says, I want to log an emergency message. Deal with it in whichever way you want as an application, because the class doesn't care how you log it. The class doesn't care where the message goes. As long as the system acknowledges, yes, this is an emergency message, and I will handle it just like the original developer wanted it to. Um, so your code just depends on the interface. Um, it calls the emergency method, and then depending on your application, by default, triple logs to the database, or syslog, but maybe you'll write a high-performance uh, critical application for an important client, and you need to be woken up in the middle of the night. So you write a logging backend that hooks up to an SMS service and that wakes you in the middle of the night. That's possible. The cool thing about this is Drupal now uses this. We have these two logging methods in core, dblog and syslog, but there are tons of more out there. There are packages, they're not specific to Drupal. There are uh, HipChat loggers, there are Slack loggers. Um, great for team communication. You want to know in your team chat that something went wrong. You include them in your Drupal project, you tell Drupal, like, hey, add this particular logger to our interface, and you'll be notified in your team chat channel about what happens without having to write a single line of code or without having to deal with any bit of code that is specific to Drupal. Um, this is where the very first standard uh, has gone to. Um, it has been superseded by PSR4, uh, and that happens. Um, not only can one standard be an extension of another standard, like PSR 1 and 2, but sometimes a standard can replace another standard because the world changes. Um, I'm not going to go into the exact differences here. Uh, <coughs> suffice to specify that PSR 4 is more flexible, is more developer friendly, and you should use it. Most of Core uses it. Um, all the modules in core, uh, that you write for Drupal 8 use PSR 4. And it basically gives us a way to automatically load a class file. We don't want to load, we've got how many lines of code? A couple of hundred thousand? Uh, we don't want to load that in memory all the time. We had include files in Drupal 7, um, which you had to specify and which contain an arbitrary combination of code. Uh, we had the registry in Drupal 7, which could load a file containing a class the moment you want to use that class. Autoloading is built into PHP, um, at least when you want to use a class that doesn't exist, PHP can check if you registered a class autoloader and then use your custom autoloader to load the right file for that class and make sure the class exists. In 7, we used a database-powered solution for this, um, which ironically also used those classes. So if something with your classes is broken, and then the system needs to log that in the database, which requires classes, which need to be loaded by the database, so if your database connection is broken, you have hell on earth in Drupal 7. It's hard to debug, and it's slow because you have database queries. Um, PSRs 0 and 4 specify um, certain, sta uh, certain rules so that it's very predictable. Given a class name, you know in which file you can find it, which means that most class loaders are really fast. Some are faster than others. Some are faster in certain situations. Some are slower in those situations. Um, but they all work according to the same standards. And all these PHP packages that we all publish these days follow these standards, which means that if three out of you, you write a package and you structure your classes according to the standard, 
and I put them in my project, and I have an autoloader that also works according to standard, I can automatically load all your code without having to look at it. I don't, I don't need to do anything with it. It's that simple. And the standard is, is as follows. The class name maps to the file name, .php. It's fairly simple. Um, and then the namespace, which is kind of a directory sort of tree, maps to actual file directories. Um, so what happens if a namespace starts with backslash Drupal backslash module name, that is mapped to the source directory in your module. You know where to start. So if you have a clousy module, and you have a class called rules in backslash Drupal backslash clousy backslash drool, rules, the whole autoloader knows to look in the source directory of the clousy module and nowhere else. And it finds a file called clousy.php and it says, yes, I found what I needed. It includes the file and PHP is like, hey, this class now exists. Cool. I can create an object out of it for you. And you don't even know what happened as a developer in the background. You can just create a new instance of the rules class. And you don't even know that the whole autoloader did all these things for you in the background. It's predictable. It's fast. It's really, really fast. And it makes sure that all these packages work together. The cool thing about Composer is that every package can specify these namespace roots. Like I said, if you have in Drupal, we have the convention that backslash Drupal backslash module name maps to the source directory in your module directory or the module root folder. Um, and whatever convention you want to use, that's fine. But you can specify all these things in your Composer file. So if you run Composer install, it doesn't only download the dependencies and puts them in the right place. It also creates an autoloader for you that enables you to automatically load all these classes and interfaces automatically without you knowing anything about it. You just have to include the autoloader file and you're set. It makes it easy, fast, and painless to reuse other people's code. As you can see, we skipped a few. We went from one, two, uh, zero, uh, one, two, three, and four to seven. That's because some of these standards haven't been accepted yet. More about that later. The seventh one is about HTTP messages. Like I said before, Symfony has a workaround for that temporarily, otherwise they break things. Um, HTTP 2 came out in the spring, I think, this summer. Um, shortly after that, this standard was published. It describes a couple of interfaces in PHP to describe HTTP requests and responses. Um, Symfony is only one of the frameworks we happen to use in Drupal 8, um, but it's only one of the frameworks that provides HTTP request handling and that lets you, as a developer, return responses that it then converts to an HTTP response and sends it back to the client on the other side of the world. Um, but that's kind of silly. Why would we have all these? But the, the implementations are different because maybe you want a very lightweight framework uh, that only works for Apache or Nginx. That's all you need, and you need the speed, all right? But you want it to be interoperable. Yeah? You have your library that works with a request. Um, but sometimes for Drupal, we need something that works on every web server, on every platform. Cool, so we use something that's slightly slower um, and that supports everything, but that still works according to the interface. And then you work on a client project and it needs raw speed. And you know, I'm gonna work on Nginx anyway. So you could theoretically um, have a user framework that gets all this information from Nginx, doesn't work with Apache, doesn't work with IIS, but it's fast because it only does the one specific thing. But because it all implements the same interface, your library that handles requests and says like, oh yeah, I need to get some get parameters from here and post parameters, maybe it's a form library, it will still work. Because it all specifies, or it all works with the same interface for handling HTTP messages. The implementation is just different. All right, we've come to all the standards that haven't been accepted yet, and there are more that haven't been accepted than the ones that have. Um, they're called drafts, like the beer. Um, they are not in review yet, they're not in voting, they're, well some of them are, um, but they're still being worked on. They're, you can use them if you want, but they can change. Nobody else implements them yet. One of them is PSR5 for documentation. It is attempted, or they attempted to make it the successor to the PHP doc project. Um, one of the things that you are familiar with are probably the uh, at param and at return annotations in your class or function and method doc blocks, property doc blocks. That's all part of this. Uh, the reason why this is a standard is because we want it to be, be machine parsable. The difference with the code style is that it, the code style specifies human readability, not machine readability, readability. 
This is also for machine readability. So you can have documentation routers, for instance. Um, for software, that bolus is standard. It's nowhere near done. It's been around for a while. Uh, but documentation is difficult. People don't always agree. Um, this one's great from some point of view. It's now in the review phase. It will enter the voting phase soon if they don't find major problems. Um, but caching is always an issue. Um, basically means put an item in the cache, get an item from the cache, release an item from the cache. And then you want to have TTLs. You want to have cache tags, cache contacts. You want to have deferred saving. So there's been a lot of discussion about this particular standard. And that exposes why what FIG does is not always easy. Ideally, a body like FIG, an organization, solves problems for the majority of people. Like you have a big problem, very common problem, that is relatively easy to solve. You just need people to look the same way and do the same thing so it works together. The problem with caching is that it's such a complex problem, there's been a lot of discussion about this. Should we include cache tags and deferred saving into the standard or not? Should we make it something else, optional, custom? Um, the discussion is interesting. A lot of people have completely different opinions on this. They're all more or less valid. They have all they have good points. If you're interested, um, it's a bit of a can of worms, but it's an interesting discussion that has been going on um, about this PSR. Um, everybody likes a good joke once in a while, right? Well, um, this standard is from our very own Larry Garfield. Um, I think it was a year and a half ago, maybe two and a half, where he proposed PSR 8. It's the huggable interface. If an object implements this interface, that means it says, I can be hugged. Everybody likes hugs. Um, mostly a joke, although it is a very good example of type hinting in PHP, type checking, um, maybe tiny bit of dependency injection. Um, it's educational, but remember, it's a joke. But it's around, and it will stay in draft phase forever. Um, these have been around for a while as well. Um, they don't. Describe code, not PHP code anyway. Um, security is important. We want to know when a security bug has been found. We want to um, know when it's fixed publicly. Um, these standards, uh, not a lot of work has been done on it recently, uh, but they specify how to report security bugs and how an organization like Drupal or the security team of Drupal um, can communicate about these problems in a standard format because maybe you want to have a website that aggregates all the security problems of all the open source projects. Uh, maybe you want to build it on top of composer packages so um, you can tell people like, oh, you're using these composer packages and there's security updates for them. That's useful. Uh, but you need them in a machine parsable format. So your library can parse the security um, messages and say, like, oh, these are critical, these are not so critical, uh, these are the instructions for fixing it. Um, for the last six months, nobody has worked on this. Uh, who knows what's going to happen with them? Uh, the Drupal security team doesn't, keeps an eye on it very vaguely, but because nothing has happened, they're not doing too much with it. It would potentially be cool also for Drupal because they could publish their uh, security advisories in this format and then other people's software can, do, can automatically pull it in like an RSS scraper. Um, we'll see what happens. This is one of the newer ones. Um, Little poll, who's familiar with dependency injection? It's not a, not a Drupal thing, it's a generic. Oh, okay, cool. That's good, because dependency injection is very awesome and technically very helpful. It makes your software better. Um, we use Symfony's container, or depend dependency injection component, and their service container for it in Drupal 8. There are other solutions. Um, and this standard provides a small interface uh, to describe a container like this. Um, if you're not familiar with it, dependency injection is basically a class is not allowed to talk to outside of itself. Everything it needs must be put into the class using the constructor or using a method, um, which is great because that means that you have control from outside over what the class talks to. You want a caching backend? Sure. I want you to use memory backend. Sure. Next time, if in your test, but on production, I want you to use a database cache. Ah, that's great. And usually, in a lot of applications, these come from a container. Uh, the container contains services, uh, which basically means you have one global instance of a particular thing, in general. Um, and there are different types of container solutions available. Like I said, we use the one from Symfony. Um, 
but the very basic functionality of every, that every container provides is a method to say, to ask the container, do you have this service? And give me the service. There are a lot of other things that, you can, that a container can do, but these two function, bits of functionality is what the standard describes. Um, it's still in draft phase. Um, if it is accepted, it might be implemented by Symfony. There are a few other um, very simple container solutions. Symfony's one is rather complex. Um, but that means that you can use any kind of dependent suggestion component um, in your application and your class can just be like, I need to get a container to get some services from. I don't care whose container it is, as long as it's a container that implements this interface. Again, it's about expectations, but not expecting too much. You don't want to, you want something that says it is a container, but you don't care how it works internally. That's basically what all these standards are about. Um, the last one, the newest one, is another coding standard. Um, uh, st standard. And whereas PSR2 extends PSR1, so it, it includes PSR1 and it adds more, PSR12 is basically because time. PSR2 come, is from 2012. Um, PHP has come a long way since then. It has introduced new syntax, new features, um, and our old coding standards, um, but PSR2 didn't include that yet. Didn't cover what to do with these new things. Um, so it expands on that. It corrects a few mistakes as well. Um, it's basically what you need to do if you want to go along with the time. Uh, it's a similar problem we're experiencing with our Drupal coding standards. Um, if you're using a lot of modern PHP features. Um, I haven't seen any discussions about PHP 7 yet, but there's been uh, about PHP 5.4, 5, 5, and 6. They've introduced new syntax, and it's all, it always takes at least a couple of weeks to get support for that syntax in our coding standards. Um, it's a common problem, everybody has it. Um, they try to solve it in a generic way. Conclusion, PHP is fun. Not necessarily the language, um, you know, needle and haystack fights out, back the door please. Um, but the, um, the community and the infrastructure that we have these days is fun. It is a lot better than what we had five years ago. Um, all the repetitive tasks are now standardized and automated, which basically makes our jobs a lot more fun, um, less tedious. I'll upload these slides to SlideShare uh, shortly after uh, this presentation ends. Um, if you want to find out more about FIG, this is their official website with an overview of the standards, the standards current statuses. Um, you have some links to IRC and everything, uh, the GitHub account they use. Again, this is me. Um, you can take a picture or look it up on SlideShare soon. If you have any questions about what PHP has gone through in the past few years? Klausi. Um, I'm not involved. Um, I personally, I like it, uh, what happens here, um, more as a user than as someone who's involved in designing these standards. Um, partly because I haven't had a reason to be involved yet, partly because maybe I don't know enough yet, but that might be the imposter syndrome exposing itself. Um, so the answer is no. Um, I'm not aware of other people being involved. I uh, witnessed some of the discussions on Twitter, for instance, um, and some of the PR. I, I sometimes go through the commits in the Git repository just to keep an eye on it a little bit, you know, out of interest, not out of control. Um, I see Larry Garfield around. He's the author of two or three standards, at least. He's been the, uh, he's supported a couple of other standards. Um, and it's not that I feel that Larry Garfield is the only one, it's really, um, it's partly the whole over my head thing, but that might be the imposter syndrome, and um, it's partly, I haven't had, I haven't tried. Maybe I should, um, maybe we all should keep an eye on this and raise a flag if we see something interesting, good or bad. Um, they are accessible. You can go on IRC, I've looked there sometimes, um, and they're very open. Yeah, so open source also means the decision process in this particular case. Um, so if you're interested, feel free, join them, ask questions. Um, most of the people involved here are diehard PHP community members who are more than willing to answer questions on these things 
on Twitter, on IRC, or on a mailing list. Um, they, they, are, they are presented at PHP conferences. They're very open about these things. Even if you're just curious, stick your hand in there and learn more. If you want to have that discussion, let's take it outside. <laughs> um, basically, indentation is the religion of programmers. Um, it's a very touchy subject, and it doesn't, in practice, it doesn't always really matter. Um, the this sheer amount of code that we usually work with, I don't think that indentation is that relevant, whether it's four or one character or six. Um, I do think that we should adopt PSR2 and eventually PSR12. Um, 12 over 2 because of the reason I just mentioned. It's more modern. It's, um, um, it solves the problem that we have right now. We have a team, a few people that work on the documentation side uh, um, and coding style guides, but they can't keep up. Um, not everybody is technical, which means that sometimes you have to explain um, technical functionality to a less technical person in order to get the changes done. Um, also that not many people are part of these discussions, which means that discussions take a long time. It's, it takes a long time to build consensus if it even happens at all. Um, as an example, um, PHP 5.3 or 4 introduced the short array syntax, which means you can use two square brackets to describe an array instead of typing the word array with, curly, uh, with, with regular brackets. And um, those at the time were not part of our coding standards. Um, so according to some people, that meant that we were not allowed to use them. Um, well, we're stubborn. We just started using them in core anyway, and our documentation maintainer was not entirely pleased with that because it wasn't part of the coding standards. And we're like, it's part of PHP. You should have updated the coding standards. Um, so that's the kind of discussion that you will have at some point. Um, referring to classes, we always like, oh, we need the fully qualified class name, which is the class name, including the namespace. But sometimes that's just completely useless, especially with PHP 5.5, where there's a dynamic class constant, it's called class, um, on every class, which resolves to the fully qualified namespace as a uh, class name as a string. So if you have the name of a class, colon, colon, the word class as a, as a constant, and you use it in something, it's a string with the full name which is useful for error messages, for instance, because if you refactor your code and you change the name or the namespace of a class, um, PHP Storm can do that automatically for you everywhere, but it can't stand for these things in strings. Uh, but because this is a piece of executed PHP code, it's very useful. But that's not part of our coding standards, so we're not allowed to use that. <laughs> we just do it, because it works. It works. It's basically paving the cow paths. Um, so sometimes it's not always the most pleasant solution from a social perspective, but if people start using it because it works, then maybe we create the cow paths, we you know, like walk across the, the grass, maybe we should just make a path there. You know, uh, pave the path, alter our documentation standards based on what people actually want to use because it just works. Um, in short, our process for of keeping our documentation standards up to date is slow, there's not enough, um, um, people power, manpower available to um, work on these things. So I think that eventually in the long run, rather sooner than later, we should adopt these standards and save ourselves the trouble. Yes? I think what works, what has worked best so far for changing Google's coding standards is just using something different. Like you mentioned, this class constant, for example, that's the short array syntax. People, so we weren't in the standards, but people were just using it, and the coding standards had to follow soon after that. Yeah, paving the cap. So They'll notice. <laughs> yes, at some point there is so much code in, in, in Drupal compared to four spaces that we just adopt PSR2. Yeah, um, that is potentially possible. Um, the, uh, the tricky part here is that we're actually very nice and honest and open and transparent people, um, which ultimately results in peer reviews. So if I write a patch, any of you schmucks can review it and say, oh, this is good or this is bad. Um, 
So if I decide to adopt PSR2, and there's one of you who's like, nah, 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 I don't like that, um, then my sneaky plan fails. Um, so in order to do this, you would need a couple of people who semi-secretly agree that they will, they will accept each other's patches only if they follow PSR2, then get things into core, and then be like, oh, I don't know, this was in core. Maybe we should, maybe we should change our coding standards to work with this. Um, there are also, uh, an IDE like PSP Storm can convert all of this to PSR2. Every, all our entire code, core code base can convert to PSR2 with a click of a button or even a shortcut, um, and we can commit that. The problem is that we'll break patches, which is actually the reason that we haven't done this conversion before from a practical point of view. Um, we say that we have, at this point, 250 active patches in the queue, um, 500,000, maybe, uh, that people work on, and if you change the coding standards, it means that almost every single line in the code will be changed. There will be indentation changes. Um, sometimes with an if statement, uh, we have the curly bracket in the same line. PSR2 says act goes in the next line. You have all these tiny little changes all over the code, so pretty much any patch is going to be broken by such a change, which means that we have to reroll 250, 500, 1,000 patches. Um, Blend this on our contribution workflow, but that's going to happen, it's going to frustrate people. So that is a practical reason for not doing it. Um, at some point, if we want to switch, we have, we'll have to do it anyway. Um, but so far, it's been held up on this reason, among other things. I'd like to go back to actually what you stated for, I think it was PSR 2 and 12. Um, you stated something about documentation for people who don't know how to use the, the code uh, itself. Um, so did you do things like auto documentation? Ah, um, it's, it's kind of a, it's a, um, Actually, no, PSR5 is, uh, sorry, is for the documentation blocks. But my, my related question was kind of, um, for instance, when I have a document um, where I'm writing up, you know, okay, here's the class that I've written and I want you to use it like this, um, does it actually then uh, shortcut creating some of that documentation for me? Uh, no. Um, what it does, the, the format specifies a few uh, things for writing these doc blocks. Um, the actual description is usually just the first few lines of the doc block, but it, 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 it more directly specifies things like the, the annotations, which are the keywords you see in doc blocks that start with an at sign, like in an email address, uh, because those are markers for machine parsable documentation in documentation blocks. And that's, <clears throat> that's mostly what uh, PSR5 specifies and what PHP doc specified in the past and still does. Um, it also specifies the, the, the possible values for these little tags, because if you have an at return, um, you can only use a valid PHP data type as a value for an at return annotation. Um, that includes any class name, any interface name. But if you do at return foo, then that's not really a data type unless you have a class called foo. Um, so there are some restrictions, and, and those are the kinds of things that PSR5 defines, because then, um, uh, a documentation parser can read that, it's machine readable, and then make a nice UI out of it so you can browse it. You're like, oh, we've got these classes, they extend the other classes, and that's how it all works together. Uh, one example is API to Drupal Um The other two, uh, PSRs 1, 2, and 12, are really for uh, formatting the actual code, the, the logical code that is executed on, on runtime. Um, and they have nothing to do with machine interoperability, it's really just so that I understand your code much more easily because we use the same formatting. It's easier to read. That's basically what those are for. Get a question? Yeah, uh, I think you're speaking maybe down the side of the scope. Uh, what's the procedure to change the coding standards? What, sorry? What the procedure of changing the coding standards of Drupal. Right. Um, so, um, basically, there are a couple of requirements. Uh, the first one is have a lot of patience. Um, there is a project on Drupal.org under which uh, these uh, changes can be proposed. It, they just have an issue, issue queue like any other project. Um, there are some guidelines, I don't know from the top of my head, I'd have to look them up. Usually whether it's a small change, it's fine, as if it's a complex change, then Jennifer is like, oh, follow the standards because complex change, we want everybody to understand. <coughs> That's perfectly sensible. Um, you propose your change there, um, like any other change in core. Um, so like, oh, we've got this problem, this is how we can fix it, this is the proposed change, 
Uh, these are the drawbacks. These are like maybe there's a, a BC break. You can have a BC break in a documentation standard, for instance, uh, because what if patches no longer apply? Like if you're changing something, um, or if you're changing the allowed values for an annotation, that means that um, the machine parsable values are different, which means that a documentation parser could have problem, uh, could have a problem with that new value that we're introducing. Um, so those are things to keep into account. Then there's a discussion, and I think the policy is that after consensus has been reached, sort of, they keep it open for a few weeks, and then if nobody, like, is in like a final review phase, and then if nobody uh, files any complaints or finds any problems with the, with the proposed change, um, then it's fixed, then it's gonna go into the handbook, and we'll accept it. Um, it takes a few weeks, though, and like I said, um, it, usually we require a little bit of discussion about these things, and if not enough people are interested, there's not going to be discussion, so it can't even be reviewed, let alone be fixed. So it depends a little. Sometimes there's a more direct approach where we're like, there's an obvious problem, it's like, ah, oh, quick, quick, quick. Um, if Jennifer Hodgson, who's the documentation maintainer, understands, um, and it's an actual obvious problem, then that works too. Um, it's a little less specific or, or explicit than filing a patch that changes the code, that must pass test part review and all that. Um, it's more of a social process than anything. More questions? Ah, oh, I'm glad that I've been so clear. Um, thank you for coming. I'll be around until Sunday lunchtime-ish, so if you have any questions uh, that you cannot, uh, please go to these websites and all these things, um, because they can do a lot better job at explaining all the details than I can. Um, if you do have questions, if you'd like to know more, hit me up this week. Thank you for coming.